Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Alexander Virilin, and today we'll be talking about MPLS in data centers. Um, just before we get started, just a few words about, about Yandex. So, what is it? Yandex is the biggest IT company in Russia and one of the biggest, largest uh, IT companies in Europe. So, Yandex is the huge digital ecosystem of consumer services. The services like uh, Yandex Search, which is, the, which is the leading search engine in Russia, I mean, uh, with, with, with the leading market share. Uh, there are also services like Yandex Direct, which is the largest uh, contextual advertisement network yeah, in Russia. There are also services like uh, Yandex Taxi, car sharing, uh, food delivery, just to name a few. And uh, recently, Yandex has launched a new service, uh, Yandex Public Cloud, uh, where, where in, uh, I'm in charge of network infrastructure. So, MPLS and data centers. MPLS and data centers, I know that sounds slightly untypical and extraordinary. And I'm kind of feeling that for those of you who have ever built data center networks or operated them, MPLS and data centers more likely sounds weird or, or even insane. And why is that? That's probably because MPLS is perceived as something, perceived uh, like something from service providers, uh, like something complex. And, and indeed, all that stuff like AGP plus LDP, uh, there, uh, I'm sure you know the problems with synchronization. And of course, RSVP on top of it for traffic engineering. All of that is slightly complicated. And given all that, the question is, who might be that crazy to want to bring MPLS into data center networks? And yeah, well, the reason I'm here today is to show you that MPLS and data centers uh, can have nothing in common with complexity and be an elegant solution on the contrary. The solution to many different scenarios. And, and that MPLS in, can make things easier or more manageable, yeah, to want a better word. So let's take a look, uh, pardon? Yes. Let's take a look at this slide. There is a typical data center network depicted. Uh, it has close topology, or excuse me, according to Russ White, it has CLO topology. Uh, but yeah, anyway, it, has, it consists of several layers, like leaf layer, spine level, and NH pod. Um, that's what our data center fabric network look like, looks like. Uh, in the data center network, we have uh, different protocols. We have APV4 for the overall network, and the primary usage of the overall network is to provide our customers with their own virtual networks. Uh, where they can run virtual machines and so on and so forth. We also have EPV6 uh, for our core cloud components. So basically every core cloud service like network block storage, object storage, databases, any service uh, uses EPV6. And by the way, the volumes of uh, EPV6 traffic exceeds those of EPV4. Uh, and of course we've got MPLS, uh, which is the topic of our discussion. It is also worth noticing that uh, in the data center fabric we use only commodity network gears. By commodity network gears, I mean uh, general typical layer of free switches based on Tomahawk or Trident uh, chipsets, ASICs. So let's finally take a look at the first MPLS enabled scenario. I mean the scenario where we fully employ MPLS. Uh, it's uh, delivering packets to the internet and, and back. Uh, so, when a client's virtual machine sends a packet to the internet, the packet passes the overlay network and enters Cloud Gateway. Cloud Gateway is, is a special network appliance which bridges the gap between the overlay and underlay networks. Uh, Cloud Gateway receiving the packet, uh, receiving the packet and with, uh, with the help of route, uh, of route reflector, knows what a particular border router it needs to send the packet to. So, it imposes uh, transport label and send the packet to the fabric. Fabric, I mean those commodity network gears, perform trivial uh, swap operation until the packet enters, uh, until the packet gets the edge of the data center network. At the edge, an additional transport label imposed in order to send the packet over the backbone, and that packet with two labels imposed, label packet, travels the backbone network, and few hops before border router, all those transport labels get stripped, and the pure IP packet is sent to the internet through the border router. 
the reverse path is pretty the same. As simple as that. However, let me shed some light uh, on, on the detail, details. Well, just to remind you that MPLS is not complex as long as you don't bring those protocols in your network, especially in data center network. So we didn't either. Instead, we use only BGP and BGP label cast, in particular to carry label bidding information. Then network appliance we use. The already mentioned Cloud Gateway is our internal development. Uh, it's a key component of cloud network uh, ecosystem, let me say so. And, and it is based on FDIO vector packet processing for data plane and GoBGP for control plane. We also have uh, load balancers, which is just another type of Cloud Gateway based, based on Cloud Gateway. We also have various route reflectors, route injectors, uh, filter nodes management nodes, and so on. Cloud Connector. Cloud Connector is another key component uh, of our network. As you can guess, Cloud Connector connects the data center network to the backbone network. On the backbone side, uh, it has IGP, LDP, RSVP, all that stuff. On the backbone network, it has only BGP level unicast. So Cloud Connector is that device which imposes an additional transport label in order to send packet over the backbone. Well. Uh, cloud connector is, is the same commodity network gear, so the same layer of free switches, uh, layer of free switch we use everywhere in our network. Couple words about the backbone network. So that's a typical region depicted. Our backbone network interconnects uh, availability zones and points of presence. Availability zones are our data centers housing thousands of servers and points of presence, the special technical sites with only network, network equipment. So, uh, Terabits of bandwidth, minimal latency, it's all about the backbone network. And now how routing information is distributed. It's, it's slightly messy site, but yeah, I hope, I hope it's readable though. So uh, what I wanted you to see is that BGP label unicast is used only to distribute label bindings only to loopback interfaces of network appliances. Those network appliances which need to communicate with each other. Every network appliance establish um, direct connected external BGP label unicast session with fabric device. Uh, and overall, BGP and MPLS itself forms a very teeny transport system for us. Teeny transport system over the data center networks and over the backbone networks, backbone network. So after distribution, all those um, Le after distribution of, of loopback reachability information, uh, those network appliances, and actually not only network appliances, but the routers, for example, so they can set up their own BGP session on top of that transport system and exchange their own routing information, and then send whatever type of traffic they want. It might be pure PV4, pure PV6, and, or even MPLS. So it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. That sort of flexibility which MPLS gives us is, is very appealing. What is also important, that's all keep, keeping the network beneath absolutely unaware of any of that. Moreover, the beauty of MPLS is that we can seamlessly integrate into the backbone network. Um, so a teeny data plane just uh, stack of labels and very simple minimalistic control plane BGP with minimum uh, minimum amounts of loopback announces and very very little state uh, in, in the network and speaking of state there is actually no additional state in the, the backbone network because cloud connector because of cloud connector uh, cloud connector with the help of label unicast route reflector you know, root reflector in this case uh, imposes that additional transport labels. Well, I hope you more or less familiar with the key idea and let me show you some MPLS, uh, MPLS enable scenarios to go on. Now we can in such cool way deliver packets to the internet and back, but that's not enough for our customers. They want more and they ask for some sort of disaster recovery. And the best way to do it is to is to 
deploy virtual machines in every availability zone, and the regional level load balancer helps us to distribute, to deliver traffic to them. The idea is pretty trivial. We set up load balancer nodes in every availability zone, and those load balancer nodes start announcing any cast rules to butter routers. Then, butter routers, butter routers, um, even the distribute balancing coming from the internet traffic over those availability zones over load balancer nodes. And now, if a customer's virtual machine happened to die in one availability zone, that's not a problem anymore because load balance node just withdraw those unicast announcers and, and that's all. So traffic, will, uh, traffic is distributed to the other availability zones. But what, what if a load balance node dies? That's a problem. That's a problem because every load balance node represent, uh, represent itself a next hop entry in and butter routers for those unicast routes. And if butter routers are not consistent hashing capable, and they are not in our case, removing just one entry, just one next hop entry, leads to all flows to be rehashed. And uh, for example, TCP sessions get redirected to wrong destination and eventually dropped. So the failure only one load balance node in one availability zone affects all the traffic, all the traffic in the whole region. That, that's quite a big problem. But what can we do about that? Hopefully, like many problems, this one can be solved by adding more layers. So we basically, we just uh, have preload balancer. So Yes, small errors. We put an additional box in the middle, uh, we name it preload balancer, and these preload balancers re-announce routes from load balancer nodes to butter routers, and they are now next hop entries in butter routers. Unlike load balancers, which are under development and constantly receive updates, sometimes failures or reboots, uh, preload balancer stays almost untouched. And uh, because they, they very rarely receive any updates. These preload balancers keeps the next hop list uh, in, uh, on butter routers very stable. So now what happens in availability zone A stays in availability zone A. So that's not disrupts all the traffic anymore on, in the whole region. So the other zones are unaffected, and even more. Load balancer nodes are consistent hashing capable within the region. And um, so even the failure of one availability of one load balancer node in one availability zone never disrupts traffic anymore. And now you may ask me, how is this all relevant to MPLS? And the, the answer is that because of MPLS, we, we, were ab we was able to put this preload balancer node somewhere in edge pod and forget about them. Uh, and MPLS does the rest job. Uh, I mean, MPLS interconnects all those preload balancers and load balancers. The cool thing is that we, we changed entirely nothing on the fabric to support this scenario. So this, this, this problem showed up very, just all of a sudden, and we can can it, we was able to quickly address it. Well, let's take a look on the next impossible scenario. Cloud market in Russia is still emerging. Uh, we receive new customer requirements on a daily basis, and one big customer uh, comes and says that he wants to consume our cloud services, but he has his own data center. He has already heavily invested in, and therefore has no plans to drop it. So basically, this client wants uh, a fat pipe between his data center and cloud. And that's, that's not a problem, because we've got MPLS on our data center fabric. Uh, take a look at this slide. The packet pass is pretty the same, uh, but there is just additional uh, service label here. Uh, is added uh, on the bottom. So MPLS enables us to quickly address customer scenarios uh, very shortly to, to launch new, new services. B 
bare metal case. Once you started provide customers with new services, you, you can stop doing. So another big customer uh, comes and says that he has seen some pictures of our data center and want, rents, and want to rent racks in all of them. And that's not the whole story. Uh, this customer also wants to consume cloud services and as a chair on the cake, he has his own data center and he wants to interconnect all of that. So to interconnect uh, uh, those racks, cloud and uh, his own data center. We turn some leaf switches into PE routers in terms of MPLS and, and here we go. So those leaf switches, now PE routers, encapsulate uh, clients' traffic into MPLS, send it uh, to the fabric and the packets delivered to Cloud Gateway if they need to get to uh, the, uh, the overland, overland network or to Butter Router if they need to get to uh, customer on-premise data center. So turning some switches into PE routers uh, was the only we needed to do to provide our customers with this, with this scenario. The, remain, the, the rest in the network remained absolutely untouched. So this is just another example how MPLS enables us to quickly launch and deliver services. So apparently that's the picture uh, the customer has seen. Uh, uh, you can see the, our typical data center point of delivery. Uh, Yandex builds its own data centers. Uh, and I mean from Greenfield. And that's just zoomed picture of, of server rack. And b by showing all of this, I want you uh, I want to show you another great approach we've been able to take because of impulse now that's on fabric. Uh, this concept, it's your own duck food or duck fooding. What is this concept about? We are true believers in this concept. And basically this concept means that you should consume the same product. You should yourself consume the same product or infrastructure in our case you provide your customers with. This is the only way to understand what, what the customer feel about the product or the infrastructure, what is good, what is bad. In other words, to have the same experience, um, to have the same pains that the customers have. And I tried to depict a typical rack layout in the, in the data center. It's quite schematic, but can provide the basic idea. So all the previously mentioned network appliances are virtual machines. Uh, unlike Customers' virtual machines, which live entirely in the overall network, these network machines, I mean uh, network appliances, are directly connected to the underlying network uh, through via uh, SROUV functionality. So anyway, all these network machines, all these virtual machines live in the same racks with customers and share the same racks. Uh, they run really, literally alongside to each other in, in the same racks. So there are common components in our, uh, there are common cloud components, for instance, cloud schedule, which operates virtual machines, um, common network storage and the common network infrastructure beneath after all. So that, all that, so that, All that leads to, yeah, to say, all that infrastructure sharing, common infrastructure sharing, or reusing reusage of the common components lowers our costs, and all that leads to, firstly, our customers benefit from uh, the reliable infrastructure uh, because we intend to keep our infrastructure reliable in order to. Uh, to be able to run our own critical network appliances. And the second, as a result, our infrastructure is so reliable so we don't need to, to run our network appliances somewhere else but in, in the same infrastructure. So we don't build any additional parallel infrastructure to run our network appliances. That lowers our capex. And we don't need to, we, we, there is no need to run there is no need to treat our network appliances uh, in any special way, uh, and that lowers our maintenance and 
you know, objects eventually. And because of MPLS on our data center fabric, we can run uh, network appliances wherever we want, and MPLS simply interconnects them. We are not limited by the size, for instance, uh, edge port where typically um, network related stuff are located. So appliances run in, in points of delivery. And what is also nice that we can easily scale network appliances, scale them out whenever we need it, uh, when another workloads come. So that's, that's, we can scale them because they're a regular virtual machine. That's, that's pretty useful. And now about some bugs we, we have encountered. So everything wasn't that shiny. We had some bugs in, we have, actually we had a lot of bugs in data plane. We had a lot of bugs in control plane. Uh, and I want to show you some. So take a look at this slide. What's wrong with this MPLS header? It's wrong because it shouldn't be there, actually, because it's implicit now. Um, so <laughs> many of you who code on Python knows that explicit null is better than implicit, and apparently our vendor thinks the same way. Um, so implicit null is broken. Uh, that's not a problem. We don't give up that easily. Let's try explicit null. But it didn't work, and I think that piece of hardware uh, just takes uh, a wrong offset and uh, normal packets uh, turn into garbage. Anyway, those bugs were solved, just to show you. And in the conclusion, so I could have, actually I could have had just only that slide in my presentation because this quote from uh, amazing book, Navigating Network Complexity, perfectly explain, explains the key idea. Uh, but then I decided I needed more pictures, uh, more examples, uh, so my presentation to be accepted. Um, anyway, despite all the preconceptions, uh, we chose MPLS because, um, because it's fully addressed our needs. And MPLS simplified, and actually MPLS simplified our data center network. MPLS is not complex, especially the way we use it, uh, but very powerful. And the last, the last before, before the launch, uh, there are talks or rumors that MPLS is dying or already dead. It's not. MPLS lives and prospers, and I hope it will. So thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, if you've got any questions, I'm at your disposal. Anybody questions? Come on up. Hi there, Jason Brody and Vesco. Um, great talk. Uh, just curious, did you run into anything with um, in your when you were out with collectors with uh, point of view? Are you using like any BGP or like optimal mount route reflection or anything? No, we don't right. have any IGP on routing reflections on our okay. route reflectors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just BGP. Uh, BGP for. Yeah, resolution next hope. Okay, that's, that's it. That's okay, all. thanks. So no GP at all. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Thank you. We'll show you a spasiba. <laughs> Thank you.